the American Sport Cavalcade. A panorama of speed, color, drama, and excitement. The American Sport Cavalcade. Baton Rouge is the state capital of Louisiana. Bat Rouge is tasty Cajun cooking. Bat Rouge is anti-felon plantations in the Mississippi River. Bat Rouge is hot. It is 93 degrees. It is 90% humidity here at State Capitol Dragway for the 15th running of the High Low Auto Supply Cajun Nationals. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Evans, just looking for a little bit of shade. But actually, we're kind of spoiled. The first six races were run under ideal weather and track conditions. Not so today. And the heat and the humidity doesn't just wear down people, it also saps the power from these racing engines. But that could be good in some respects, because the race track doesn't like it either, and it is very greasy. On a day like this, anything could happen, and anybody could win. Right now, my pal Brock Yates is with one team is a little bit despondent. They're not having the dream season they expected. Exactly right, Steve, and that's the team of defending Winston Funny Car champion Bruce Larson. But earlier today, in round one, against Tim Gross, there was a ray of sunshine. The low ET of elimination, the 538 in the Louisiana heat, thanks in part to the efforts of crew chief Maynard Yanks. Maynard, I know you guys are pretty high in the points, number two, but you not won any events so far this year, and you've been struggling a little bit. Uh, but now you got by the first round, you faced Ed McCulloch in the second round, man who's won two events in a row, and then a runner-up in Memphis. Uh, how do things look? Well, uh, they look pretty good as long as uh, we make the right moves here for the next round. The track's going to get edgy, we're sure of that. The heat's going to get to it. It's getting to us. Uh, we hope we make the right moves here. Well, uh, it gets, uh, it's funny in this kind of sport, uh, you think you got a handle on things and all of a sudden it just kind of instantly goes away on you. Oh, these things will humble you real quick. <laughs> uh, we've, we've really been struggling with our clutch system this year and uh, we've had about three or four different units in it and this is probably the most promising run we just made and we're just going to try and soften it and make it repeat similar, just soften it a little bit. Well, we sure wish you luck. Thank you. All the best. The one Maynard Yanks and Bruce Larson. And now... Let's go to the man who can tell us more about these clutch problems and the complexity of trying to keep a car in contention in this kind of competition. Our pal, Big Daddy Don Garlitz. Thank you, Brock. I'm here in Gary Ormsby's pit, and you're absolutely right. The clutch is the number one problem facing these fuel cars this year, and more specifically, the clutch management system. Teams like Gary Ormsby and Bruce Larson have made some good runs, but they have not demonstrated the consistency that they had last year with those electronic systems that gave you the same thing every time. You see, NHRA at the beginning of the year took the electronics off and made you put hydraulic pneumatic systems on the cars. Well, that has been a problem. A little later in the show, I'm going to show you a couple of these systems and just how they work and what the problems have been with them. But right now, let's go to Pro Stock. Absolutely. The first side-by-side -side racing we'll see here today at the Hilo Auto Supply Cajun Nationals. The biggest crowd in the history of state capital dragway. The heat doesn't bother these folks. They're used to it, Brock. Oh, they sure are. They come in all around Louisiana and the whole deep south to see guys like Mark Frolick versus Bruce Allen here in the second round of Pro Stock. The pro stock cars, Don Garlitz, are more sensitive to this heat even than the dragsters and the funny cars. Well, they can't put nitro in them, and they can't speed the blower up. They got to use that gasoline, that stuff we wash parts with. <laughs> that gasoline is about six bucks a gallon, however, at about 114 octane. Last year, here in the first round of Pro Stock, Mark Powick red -lighted. He left the starting line too soon, a foul start. But that was before he got the kind of confidence that owning the national record will give you. Powick is officially the quickest pro stocker of them all at 7.22 seconds. But you know, Brock, he has never beaten that yellow car. He has never beat Bruce Allen in any colored car. Well, Bruce Allen, of course, has won this race the last two years, 88 and 89. And the year before, in 87, he was a runner-up. Powick from Medina, Ohio, one of the real newcomers in pro stock. And, boy, he has been strong in the last couple of seasons. 
strong this weekend. He has a lane choice over. Bruce Allen has selected the lane nearest the camera. Now, these cars are having traction problems as well, Don Garlitz. It just doesn't manifest itself in tire smoke like it does with the fuelers. That's right. They leave it over 8,000 RPM, and even though they don't smoke the tires, the wheels will spin. If you'll watch closely on the back, you'll notice that they don't move out like they do normally. The wheels are moving real fast, and that's slippage. This is a good race. Side by side, charging for the quarter mile point it is. It is Mark Powick. For the first time ever, he has defeated the Rare and Morrison team with Bruce Allen driving a 743 to a 751. It sure seems to me, as I watch this replay, that Powick must have been thinking about that red light because he let Allen go. And then on top of that, Allen was getting a little tire slippage at the start. You could see the blue smoke following the car. And that's all Powick needed because he just gathered him up in the middle of the course and actually outran him. And I bet he was tickled about that. Victory by about a wheel's win. Let's go to the winner. Well, Marcus, 743 was almost not enough to catch Bruce. Well, I'll tell you, Steve, it shook really bad in second and third gear, and uh, I just hung on, you know. I think Bruce got out on me a little bit, and, yep. and yeah, I thought he did, and I, I, I came back around him. You know, we run each other probably six, seven times now and never beat him. We finally got that nut crack. Good job. Thank you. Headed to the semis, Mark Powick. Well, Don, uh, you know his reaction time was almost eight hundredths of a second slower than uh, Allen's, and he's going to have to improve on that a bunch if he's going on. He'll sure have to sharpen up. Here in the Gary Ormsby pit, we see the man himself in the cockpit, and there's the crew, captained by Lee Beard, climbing that engine, starting it before they go to the starting line. Used to be Don Garlic, you only warmed the engine up once in the morning, and from then you waited till you got to the line to race. They do so much work for these engines, Steve. Between rounds, they have to start, or they can't take the chance of going up to the starting line and the engine having something wrong with it. And that nitro methane fuel is not cheap. It's an expensive deal, about $450 to do what you see there. Oh. All right, let's talk about pro stock again. Here's the second race in round two, and uh, as usual, you're going to ride with the man himself, Bob Glidden. A man who has won this Cajun Nationals event four times at 77, 78, 79, and 81. His opponent here is Daryl Alderman, the only Dodge in all of pro stock racing, one competitive automobile, because Glidden has seen the taillights of it on several occasions. Well, Darrell Alderman was the runner-up at the Mid-South Nationals of Memphis. Uh, he beat Scott Jeffrey on in round number one, qualified in the second spot. Of course, Glidden, he beat Joe Lapone in the first round and uh, was the seventh qualifier. Kind of down in the standings for him, uh, Don Garlick. Yeah, Glidden hadn't been having the best of the year. However, he's right up there in the points. We can see Glidden's hand resting on the first of three levers he must pull to execute the shift from first to fourth in just a little over seven seconds. The RPMs come up to a little over 8,000, and they literally just slide their foot off the clutch, and we're underway with Bob Glidden. The Ford probe has broken down. Something in the drivetrain, you could hear the crunching, and the acceleration stop. Absolutely, the Dodge goes on to victory at 7.44 seconds for Daryl Alderman. Bob Glidden out in round number two as he clunks his way down the shutdown area. Meanwhile, back in the top fuel pits, the Jeff and Susan Bernstein own dragster, driven by Michael Brotherton. They're ready to hit to race Shirley Muldowney. Brought to you by the record crowd of 32,000 that has mobbed the state capitol dragway here in Baton Rouge, the High Low Cajun National. And now let's go to Steve with Daryl Alderman. Daryl, the nitro cars are fighting for traction. You guys seem to be fighting for control. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough out there, Steve. In, in low and second gear both there, it just blew the tires off of it and went to shaking. And I'm just lucky that the same thing happened to Bob or we'd lost that one. And Mark Powell had the same thing happen to him and drove through it. Yeah, well, that's the only way you can get to the other end first is to drive through these things. Okay. See you in a second. Thank you. Okay, a couple of real old pros coming up here for more round two action of Pro Stock. Larry Morgan and Ricky Smith. Morgan's won the last two NHRA events. And uh, Don, what do you think about this tire shake business for the Pro Stock? It's a horsepower problem because of this humidity. They just can't make enough. Well, no matter the weather, this man, as of late, has been making more horsepower than anyone else. That's Larry Morgan, Newark, Ohio. And this man has been cutting the finest lights. Has had the best reaction time in the category over the last three or four races. Ricky Smith, King, North Carolina, in the Pontiac car. And if Morgan has been beaten, Don, during the course of the year, it has been by a hole shot. And this is just the kind of guy that can pull it off. 
Well, Ricky Smith has really been cutting some fine lights today, and it wouldn't surprise me to see him cut another one. Because Larry Morgan has been running strong, and that's how they make up the difference. They leave right together. Larry Morgan matches wheels with Ricky Smith. Can Ricky Smith match power with Larry Morgan? No, he cannot. It is Morgan, 7.39, a very respectable time. 187 miles per hour to a losing 7.44 at 186. Well, Steve, the start was very even. Ricky Smith did take a slight starting line advantage, but not near enough for what he was going to need when Morgan's engine began to produce power. And I want to say he was sticking to that track pretty good, too. And he pulled right out in front of Smith for a very decisive win. Here he is, Mr. Happy. Larry Morgan, Ricky Smith coming over. Beautiful, 39. Ooh, thank God for that. I got lane choice. I hit it, and it really, it's critical here. Howick it Alderman. Pretty bad that time in that lane. But I was just going to ask you that. It shook pretty bad in low gear. I, I just hope I can overcome that this next round. But I'll tell you, the track's getting pretty tricky out there now. The guy that masters the track will be bad here. Let's keep him right side up, huh? Yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, some heavy iron moving into the staging lanes. That long nose belongs to the top fuel dragster of Gene Snow, the defending champion here in Baton Rouge, Steve. And he's got a tough race when we get to that second round of top fuel against Joe Amato, the two-time NHRA Winston champ in the top fuel category. But we have got more pro stock in this round. Featuring this yellow machine, the Pontiac of Jerry Ekman. What a great year he has had. He won the season opening Winter Nationals and then the Rich Winston Invitational this year as well. But he is in tough here in round two. Warren Johnson, Duluth, Georgia, the Oldsmobile car who won here in 85 and 86, is the number one qualifier. I'll tell you what, Don Garlitz, these Oldsmobiles have really found some horsepower over the last season or two. Uh, the, Johnson used to be the only strong runner with, uh, with that brand, but now with Morgan in it, too, boy, they are tough. I'll tell you something else. With Glidden out, these pro stocks run even better. Now, if they could just get rid of that lonely Dodge, General Motors could have it all to themselves. Well, this is all GM Oldsmobile in the near lane. Pontiac, Jerry Ekman, far lane. It is Warren Johnson, the Oldsmobile at a 7.39. Larry Morgan will more like to hear that. He matched his time at 188 miles per hour. Eppin, he fought a good fight at 7.43, just not quite enough. Warren Johnson takes a slight starting line advantage. Not much, but just a little bit. A little bit means a lot in pro stock. But Johnson's been running real good today. Running low ET in round one. And it seems like he's got this Louisiana air figured out because, you know, he's won here a couple of years and he beats Ekman Hamlet. Okay, let's have a look at the Pro Stock semifinal pairings. That will be Mark Pollock versus Warren Johnson. Warren has lane choice in that race. Larry Morgan in the other Oldsmobile goes against the Dodge of Darrell Alderman with Morgan having lane choice. Well, Warren, let me guess. After talking to the other drivers, it shook hard in first and second oh, gear. Ridiculous, Steve. It was, it was just to win the round was phenomenal as hard as it shook. And that 39 of yours, which you just ran, matches wheels with the best. Well, we got to be the best. That's what this whole thing's about. With that attitude, he probably will be. Okay, we'll see him in a little while in the Pro Stock semifinals. But right now, some of the big stuff moving into the staging lanes. That is the top fuel director of Shirley Muldowney. She'll face Michael Brotherton in round two here at Hilo Auto Supply Cajun Nationals. It might be Mark Oswald and his team of Candies and Hughes. They fish, they hunt, they race all in the bayous of Louisiana. They were born and raised here. And they should be interesting to watch when we get to round two of Funny Car. But now we've got the kings of the sport, the fastest breed of them all, top fuel directors. Round number two, Gary Ormsby, the reigning Winston champion, is the first to smoke the tires, the red, green, and white car. And he'll be facing Jack Ostrander, who has been running extremely well here today, Steve. Absolutely. Uh, he has no big corporate sponsorship. Uh, the last time I checked, he was a bartender at a bowling alley in Michigan. The Boate, he's flying. Well, you know, Steve, the unsponsored cars that don't have the high-dollar parts are faring quite well here today. And these races, a lot of them are being determined by the reaction time of the driver, because almost all cars are equal on this slick surface. You know, you can kind of compare drag racing to, uh, let's say, a track meet. The runners have to react to the crack of the starter's pistol. If one is a little slower reacting, he's going to have to run harder to catch the leader. Same thing in drag racing, only here it's visual. You've got to react to the yellow light on that Christmas tree. The lanes are independently timed, and the clock starts when the wheels move, not when the light turns green. 
some of them even have those special glasses to enhance the yellow. In fact, this man has worn them. Gary Ormsby, Auburn, California, as we said, the defending Winston champ, not smiling as broadly as he was most of last year. Lee Beard is his crew chief. This is their best qualifying effort all season long at 5.06 in the number two spot. Jack Ostrander, Pontiac, Michigan. Jack, got to be pleased to be here in round number two against this kind of competition. And Mike Shelley is one of the reasons that he qualified number 10 at a nice 5.21. So it's time for the two to get together. And as always in drag racing, there's no second chances. The winner goes forward, the loser goes in the box. Well, you know, the big thing facing these guys is that clutch management system. If they can just keep those tires from spinning, the cars will run pretty good. But that has really been a problem here today, Steve. That's right. Usually, if you smoke the tires, you lose. Staged and ready. Oh, Hornsby with a tremendous hole shot, something he's famous for. A little engine problems possibly for Ostrander. Ormsby, 524. Ostrander quicker at 522, but the car just didn't leave with Ormsby's mount. 275 miles per hour to the winning speed. Here we see the remarkable reaction time of Gary Ormsby. Last year he was a killer and it looks like the old Ormsby back again. We noticed a tiny little bit of smoke off of Ostrander's tires and he was actually had the more powerful car but could not catch and make up the difference. On your screen in parentheses is the reaction time. 0.467 for Ormsby, a 0.400 is a perfect light. Ostrander's 0.517, a full half a tenth slow. That was a pretty close drag race. And I like it right there, <laughs> I'll tell you. Did you know you got there first? I thought I did, but I wasn't sure. I wasn't absolutely sure. Great driving. You ran 200 slower and still beat him. Yeah, it was close. I was a little off myself, I thought, on the starting line. It's like I was wondering about when I could see him about half track down there. I thought, wondered if I was a little late, later, and I thought. Good driving then. Thank you, Steve. Hard to believe that a run of a little over five seconds can take your breath away, but the physical and mental exertion is enormous in these automobiles. Before we go to more top fuel action in round two featuring this lady, Shirley Maldani, against Michael Brotherton, let's go to the piece Don promised us earlier about clutch management. On Frank Bradley's fuel car, he has the AFT system. It very closely resembles last year's electronics in that it brings the throwout bearing back in a series of definite movements. They accomplish this through the use of these timers and all these air valves. Look at this mess, very complicated. It was the same last year with electronics, but electricity always flows at the speed of light. Not true with air. If the temperature of the day changes, air slows down or speeds up, and the crew doesn't always get that definite clutch release like they hope for and consequently we have inconsistent times in 1990. Over here on Shirley Muldowney's pit, Ron Tobler has taken a different approach to the problem. He has installed the L&T system, no black box with a lot of timers and bells and whistles in it, a very simple system that brings the throw out bearing back very slowly and steadily. That is accomplished through the use of one jet in one of these lines. The bigger the jet, the faster the bearing comes back. The smaller the jet, the slower it comes back. Well, you think that's the answer. Very simple. Well, it would be except for still the problem of the temperature of the air causing it to flow differently from run to run. And hence, we still have the inconsistency, the number one problem facing the crew chiefs in 1990. And what should happen earlier today in round number one? Shirley Muldowney and Frank Bradley with the two different clutch setups got together side by side. It was Bradley in the near lane, the three-time Winston champion, Shirley Muldowney, on the left side of your screen, or far lane when they leave the racetrack, and Muldowney with a big hole shot. Bradley could not make it up, even though he ran quicker, 527, to Shirley's 531. Shirley Muldowney's reaction times right on the mark. And now her opponent in round number two will be Michael Brotherton. And Steve, I was particularly impressed with the run between Shirley and Frank Bradley that the cars performed almost equally with the two totally different systems and it still came down to driver reaction. Oh boy, that's uh, the way drive racing fans like it. Who's the best shoe out there? Not necessarily the best car. Shirley Muldowney does very aggressive burnouts, as you can see, getting that track good and hot, laying down her own racetrack, so to speak, the chicken run right on top of. Well, they've had a lot of trouble this year with spinning the tires, and the crew has instructed her to put down big, wide, black marks, and you can see them out there on the track. 
All right, something else. Earlier today in round one of Top Fuel, very interesting. Michael Brotherton in the car that is wrenched by Bob Flynn, along with help from veteran engine tuner Bill Schultz, met up with the Winston Points leader, Lori Johns from Corpus Christi, Texas. She's won half the races this year to this point with mechanical help from her crew chief, Larry Meyer. Now, if there was any doubt in anybody's mind, I don't know if there could be, as to this young woman's credentials, watch her driver race car. This was earlier today. Watch the car in the far lane. Big Daddy, tell us what happened. Well, she will still the car right off the line and got back in it. And darn near beat my brother. Jeff. An incredible driving job by Lori John. It's been a long time since Lori Johns has suffered a first-round defeat, and leading the point, it's the last thing you needed. Well, it started to pull the front wheels up, and we were li we had him. You know, there was no doubt about it. We were going to beat him, and and I just knew. I felt it go up, and I kept thinking, come on, come back down, come back down, and then I felt it start to lose its point of center, and it was going to go over, so I got back out of it, and just as it started to set down, I put my foot back in it, but I couldn't catch him. Good driving. Thanks. Oh, I'll say it was good driving. And here's a funny good driver in her own right, Shirley Muldowney, Mount Clemens, Michigan, driving the Larry Miner own car, but still with her husband, crew chief, Ron Tobler, handling the wrench. It's a 522, number 11 qualifier. They're finally sticking this car to the pavement, something they've had troubles doing. And, of course, as we mentioned, in the near lane, Jeff and Susan Bernstein's car with Michael Brotherton at the helm. You know, Steve, both of these drivers got to be plenty pumped up right now because both of them have won the previous round on the reaction time, and that really makes a driver feel good about himself. Well, Shirley Wildell is going to love this one, the best reaction time of the day, but something goes wrong with her car. Brotherton drives around at 526. Brock is with Bill Schultz back at the starting line. He's got to be happy for the Bernstein team. 526 uh, in these kind of conditions can't be all bad. Oh, no, it's not really bad. We're uh, back a little bit, and we're to be on that way on purpose, and we just hope these other guys don't run too much better and embarrass us. So, well, But we can got another chance to come back and do something, and uh, we will. Okay, well, good job. Congratulations. Good job on Mike's part, too. you got to be happy with him. Oh, very happy. He's a great driver. We were really happy to have him. Good. Congratulations. Anybody would be happy with Mike Brotherton. He's running 295 miles an hour, and that's what it takes to have the credentials for a fuel dragster. In this free play, we see Shirley make a brilliant start, almost a perfect reaction time. And if it hadn't have been for some mechanical problems on Shirley's car shutting her off at about the 1,000 foot, I doubt seriously that Brotherton would have won this race. Well, the heat and humidity is reflected in Mike Brotherton's elapsed time. He, like a lot of other drivers, kind of stuck in the mid-520s. Hey, listen, that's as fast as we run all weekend. Uh, everybody's dealing with the heat here. Schultz and, and uh, Flynn and uh, everybody's got this thing running. What it's going to take to win. If, if you don't smoke the tires and you get to the, the top end and the car is still pulling, you're going to get there. Those are words to win by. I hope so, Steve. Thank you. God bless you. I'm proud of you. We're going to try to do her today, Shirley. As the sun beats down here at Baton Rouge, that is the Oldsmobile of Warren Johnson. He'll face Mark Powick in the Pro Stock semifinals. They're loading up Lori John's car, and she's got to be nervous about her Winston points lead in top fuel. Even though she's won three races, her points total isn't that great, because when she had bad races, she had very bad races, like today, going out in the early rounds. Could open the door for, oh, a Gary Ornsby or a Joe Amato to maybe sneak by her here. Top fuel continuing. Gene Snow, who qualified number nine and beat Jim Head in round number one, will be up against... Joe Amato, the two-time Winston champ, who qualified number one at 503. There's the snowman, formerly a car dealer, now a very successful oil producer out of Fort Worth, Texas. Chris Eckert is his crew chief. They have really found a steady combination. It just needs to go a little bit quicker. Joe Amato, well, if he went any quicker, he'd be in the fours. One of the few tracks that the four-second barrier has not been broken on is here at State Capitol. Tim Richards would like to change all of that if he possibly could right now. But I don't think that's possible, Don. Well, I don't know. 503 is what he qualified, and it, we know that it's in there. 499 is not that far away. Uh, however, it is a hot afternoon, but Tim Richards is the master of getting the most horsepower out of one of these Hemi engines. Don't get me wrong. I'd love to see, more importantly, this crowd would love to see a big four flash up on the Baton Rouge scoreboard. Joe Amato has redlighted. He has eliminated himself, but I don't think he knows. And look how hard he's driving that car. 
This is incredible. Let's go to Brock Yates with the winning crew team at the starting line. Well, Chris, uh, I guess you'll take him any way you can get him. It wasn't pretty, but we'll take it anyway. That's exactly <laughs> right. We just dumbfounded. Well, uh, uh, they both went up in smoke, so you still had a shot at even if he hadn't red lighted. Our smoke the tire so early, and the way our fuel system is, we just don't run at that. If it smokes the tires, usually we quit. It just we can't afford to blow it up. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank Good you. job. Anyway. A real break for Gene Snow. He goes on to the next round while an Amato had a chance to gain the points and didn't do it. As we watch the replay, Amato left just a split second too soon, but with the new glasses that they wear and the way the helmets are made, I doubt seriously he ever saw the red light. Plus, Gene Snow also smoked the tires. He almost crossed the center line. If he had it, it would have been the worst of the two infractions, and Joe Amato would have been reinstated and put back into the race. I can only hope that Joe Amato saw his red light, because I'd hate to be the one to tell him. Well, by that look, he obviously did not see it. Didn't see it? No. I red light it, really? Yeah. Indeed. That hasn't happened in years. No, no, I just, I was pushing for a good tree, and I guess I just overpushed it, you know? Somebody said one time if the driver doesn't red light every once in a while, he's just not driving hard enough. Well, there's a lot of pressure on us because the, the cars are so close, you know, but... Uh, you know, it was our chance to make a move in the championship, and I guess I, I, I fumbled, you know, what can I say? Sorry to be the bearer of bad tidings. We'll be back, we'll be back. Joe obviously referring to the fact that Laurie Johns went out in round number one, which gave him a chance to catch up in the points uh, race, and of course a red light eliminates that opportunity. Now, Gary Ormsby, who is next in line, has a chance, and he has already moved on to the semifinals. Absolutely, here's Eddie Hill. He's not thinking about points right now. He's just thinking about getting a win light. And a wind light he might get, Steve, because he's running better today than he's run in a long time. He had low ET in the first round with a 5.08. And to Hill, that's really flying, and especially on this track today. Oh, absolutely. Eddie Hill, who's been drag racing all of his life, really, since uh, he was a young teenager out of Wichita Falls, Texas, where he owns a motorcycle shop that he hasn't been in the front door of in four and a half years. Because this man, Buzzy Carter, keeps him all pumped up about this NHRA professional drag racing. They want to win the title. Kenny Bernstein won four of those titles in the funny car division, but is finding top field to be a little rockier than he thought. But his main man, crew chief Dale Armstrong, appears to be getting a handle on it at this very race. A 5-13 victory in round one over the, over the always tough Dick LaHaye. So it's Bernstein against Eddie Hill, the distinctive red car, and the yellow rose from Texas. Well, one thing about his transition to top fuel, Bernstein has been driving quite well. His reaction times have been good. It's been the crew that's not got the car up to par. That's right, but he is still supporting them in everything he says and does, trying to keep that team together. Oh, it's a gorgeous race. Oh, Eddie Hill by a wheel. 523 to a 524. 257 for Hill, a much faster 271. The speeds don't win these drag races. A lap times do. And it was Eddie Hill out first. Yes, it was. Bernstein didn't get the advantage that time, Steve. Eddie Hill got it, and he needed it. The ETs were very close. As we see the Hill car come down course, we see the fuel coming out of one of the pipes on the right side of the engine, causing the mile an hour to fall off. Okay, that victory by Eddie Hill will put him in the semifinals against Gene Snow, and Eddie enjoys lane choice in that pairing. The other two, Gary Ormsby against Michael Brotherton. Gary, one more opportunity to close in on the points lead of Lori Johns. Well, Eddie Hill didn't have that 508 performance he had earlier, but boy, a 523 just nipped Mr. Bernstein. Oh, it was close down there, and I had to do a little driving that time. I got pretty close uh, to the guard wall over there. That was a close drag race there. Is the car spinning the tires, and we can't really see it. There's no smoke, but it's loose. It must have that time, or else it wouldn't have been that far out of the groove. Good driving. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. Hope we can do it again. <laughs> well, he and uh, Fuzzy Carter back at it in the pits for their uh, semifinal action and top fuel. But in the meantime, let's go to funny car action. That is Ed McCullough in that... Beautiful, funny car doing his burnout, Don Garlitz. And what do you think? Uh, have the track conditions changed enough to alter this uh, pairing against Bruce Larson significantly? 
I don't think so. I think the track is staying just about the same. The one good thing that I can say about the facility today, there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference in the lanes. The drivers move from one lane to the other to have lane choice. We don't have one lane producing all the wins. Of course, the fans like that. And of course, the Funnicars use the same basic power plant as the top fuel dragsters, 4,000 horsepower, supercharged, nitro-burning engines, and Ed McCullough has wheeled funny cars since the breed was invented, now out of Hemet, California, with Bernie Federley, his crew chief, and a number four qualifying position means they're solid, not taking any chances. Bruce Larson, his first national event win, came right here in Baton Rouge in 1988. He went on in 1989 to win the championship, thanks to a former sprint car shoe turned drag race mechanic, Maynard Yanks. Very important race coming up here, Steve. McCullough against Larson. McCullough leading the points. He wants to beat Larson real bad and maintain that lead, and Larson needs to beat McCullough to try to make up the difference. And if you think the top field directors are touchy in the clutch department, the funny cars are even worse because they don't have as much weight over the rear wheel. Ed McCullough away and an explosion on Bruce Larson's car. Ed McCullough probably even heard that one as he thunders across at 5.45 seconds. 261 miles per hour. Let's go back and see if we can tell what happened to Larson's car. Sideways in the middle of the racetrack. He's okay. Very disappointed Larson getting out of the car. Knows now that Ed McCullough stretches the Winston points lead. Throws his glove down. Not a bit happy. Not a happy camper out there today. We watch the cars leave the line. Everything looks fine. Then all of a sudden, a big flash. And I mean got to think about it. The driver was inside there when that happened. A lot of pressure, a lot of concussion. It literally blows the panels out when that happens. I tell you, it's not a nice situation to be in. And thank goodness for all the good safety equipment. Bruce, you all right? Yeah, just fine, Steve. The, the fire system really did its job because we see that a lot of fire came up around the dash panel and burned the uh, gauges and uh, up underneath the seat. But uh, fire suit's a little scorched and I'm fine. I saw you picking at your leg a little bit. Well, I was more or less looking at the back of the leg, and we see that there's a scorch mark there, and the seat is scorched, but it didn't get to me at all. What caused it? Uh, I don't know. I, I thought a blower blew off, and it's not off, so you'd have to ask Maynard if he knows. Okay, we will. Thank you. So as we clear away the Bruce Larson automobile, we've got some downtime here at the Cajun Nationals. We'll be back right after this. The presumption of action is just moments away here at the NHRA High Low Auto Supply Cajun Nationals. Here's a drag racing feature that you're sure to want to take advantage of. It's NHRA Now, presented by Castrol. NHRA Now is a 24-hour telephone hotline featuring in-depth coverage about your favorite drivers and events. Make a note of it. All right, here in the pits of Michael Brotherton, work continues. And this is, they didn't hurt anything. This is just what you have to do to all of these nitro burning engines now between rounds, at least most of them. And they really better find some power if they're to take on Gary Ormsby when the semifinals roll around. Right now, funny car competition continues. The crowd up for this. They've been waiting all day for the tire burners. And oh boy, we got a good one. John Force against Jim White and Roland Leon's famed Hawaiian automobile. And I'll tell you what, Don, John Forrest, the pressure's got to be on him. He's chasing McCulloch in the points lead, as was Larson. But Ed McCulloch just keeps winning and winning. And uh, just in the last race was the runner-up. So he's got a streak that's uh, going to be hard to beat. Well, John Forrest has got to do well at this event if he wants to seriously challenge McCullough's points lead. And Austin Coyle is just the man to give him the power to do that. Oh, absolutely. Their opponent has been running better than he has in, the, in his entire drag racing career. Jim White from Tulsa, Oklahoma, has finally seen the 520s in Roland Leong's car. Roland himself wrenching this machine with some technical assistance from a guy named Wes Cerny, who's a plenty bright guy. In fact, a lot of the crew chiefs are hiring what I like to call a thinker. Oh, there's a problem with the Jim White car. They've had to shut it off. Oh boy, is this the break John Forrest needed? He can do almost anything wrong and still win unless he crosses the center line or smacks the wall. I've always said, you gotta have a break every once in a while in drag racing because it's so demanding. And John Forrest went so many years without any luck at all. He was like runner up 12 times before he ever won a national event. Let's ride along with him. You bet he won't take it easy. He'll want lane choice, every advantage he can get. What a ride. These drivers want that full computer tape for the crew's next run. A great winning run by John Forrest. Let's go to Brock and see if we can find out what happened. 
As we watch a single by John Force of 542, I'm sure that uh, well, that's even more frustrating. Right, that'd been hard to beat, but uh, we had her hopped up pretty good. We thought we maybe had a good chance. But what it actually did is it blew the end of a spark plug right off from the casing. So as chance blowing it up because the cylinder don't fire, we decided sure. to just shut it off. They don't like to run on seven cylinders. No, not at all. We're sorry you're out. Thank you. What Roland was holding there was the porcelain of a spark plug that had never been crimped. It blew it right out of the cylinder, through the hood, and if they had to continue the run, the raw fuel would have come out that spark plug hole into the engine compartment, ignited on the hot headers, and you would have had one heck of a fire. Well, this is Freddie Neely getting ready to go in round two, and his engine apparently running on all eight cylinders, Don Garlitz. It's going to have to because he's going up against one of the toughest combinations in funny car. That is Mark Oswald in the Candies and Hughes Ford Pro. And Mark Oswald is even tougher here at the Cajuns because this is his home track. He knows what it takes to get down this racetrack. Okay, let's go to Steve. Well, coming up in the next round... John Forrest, you will have a very important date with Ed McCullough. Well, it's very exciting here, but who's got lane? You do. What do we run? 42. 42, just by a hair there. That's good. It's very critical uh, to make a move to try to get around Larson. Maybe we got a shot at that today in the point steal. We know it's going to be tough. McCullough's been tough, but Coyle's had this thing right on all weekend, so I couldn't be happier right now. We'll see you then. All right, so John Force uh, feeling pretty optimistic as we watch a Mark Oswald back to Candies and Hughes funny car. That is Leonard Hughes right there guiding him back into that critical backup maneuver, Don Garlitz. Especially at this racetrack with the conditions like they are, you must be in your tracks or you're going to spin the tires. We've got quite a contrast here. First of all, there is Mark Oswald, full-time professional funny car driver, makes a good living. Leonard Hughes, full-time professional crew chief. They both make a good living thanks to Paul Candies, the team owner. Then there's Freddie Neely. Freddie Neely from Covington, Georgia, just getting his feet wet in professional funny car racing, getting a lot of help from his crew chief, Pete Miner, and a famous old Southern pro, Clayton Harris. Now, you look at the car. If it looks familiar, you saw it seven years ago. It was the last car ever campaigned by Dale Poley when he was still on the tour. A Buick Somerset Regal body, but it is still a competitive car. They ran 556 with this car in round number one and shocked the troops. And also got lane choice against Oswald, who ran a 559. So normally you'd, uh, you'd ride with Oswald. Maybe not this time. Oh, Freddie Neely just can't stand success this early in his career. He red lights, much like Joe Amato did. Mark Oswald has been getting a lot of lucky breaks lately, and here's a huge one. Oswald smoked the tires, only runs to 685, probably would not have won had Neely not red lighted. Brock's with his crew chief, Leonard Hughes. Well, Leonard, it wasn't pretty, but uh, it was a wind light. Yeah, we got there first. That's terrible. That's not good at all. Well, the racetrack, uh, we've had a couple of those deals uh, late in the day. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, the track's real bad, and we're having trouble running on eight cylinders because we can't put any clutch in it, and, it's, and then when it does hit on eight, it wants to spend the time. Other than that, everything's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Letter to you. <laughs> Sounds like Leonard's got a lot of work and a lot of thinking to do. Here's our next pair. You thought that was a contrast. This is even uh, more unique, I think. One of the oldest drivers in funny car competition among absolutely the youngest. It'll be Tom Hoover from Minneapolis against Richard Hartman from Southern California. Right now, let's quickly go down to the top fuel pits. Don Garlitz has found some problems at Eddie Hills. Brock, Steve, I'm here in Eddie Hills pit, and this is a roller lifter out of Eddie Hills engine. Goes right down in here. It pushes the push rods up and down. It rides on the camshaft, and all those little broken parts fell down into the crankcase. There was 18 little rollers. They have found every one of them. He will be ready to go for the next round, but it could have been a disaster. If the engine had have done it earlier, it could have hydraulic, backfired, blown the supercharger off. Big trouble. Uh, you'll remember that little white puff of smoke out of the right bank of cylinders on Eddie's car and the fall off in performance against Bernstein. That explains it. So, as Richard Hartman and Tom Hoover get, do their burnouts, let's go to Steve at the far end. Well, Mark, it's a good thing that Freddie Neely got the rookie jitters and red lighted. Yeah, that was a real break. Uh, it wasn't going down the racetrack. It was just spinning the tires uncontrollably. Nothing I could do to stop it. You knew the racetrack wasn't real good, but apparently you just uh, weren't careful enough with it. Well, we were on uh, 
about six cylinders the first time and you know to win one of these races you have to run on eight cylinders and when you get those last two cylinders firing right it picks up a tremendous amount of power and so you're coming from behind more or less okay thanks mark okay that is tom hoover the veteran of funny car competition backing into position with that uh, beautiful automobile of his steve evans Oh, yeah, Tom Hoover is one of the real nice guys, just has nitro in his blood. And his crew chief, the engine builder, is his father, George Hoover. They qualified, as you can see, number two at 542. Now, it's interesting. When Richard Hartman from Laverne, California, was born, George Hoover was 62 years old. You do the math on that. Nick Bonenfant, Jr. is the crew chief on the car owned by his father. They qualified for 556, the number seven slot. Well, everybody was having a little laugh when Richard Hartman took over the driving chores of this car from R.C. Sherman. But I tell you, there ain't been many of them laughing lately. Oh, no, he comes from a strong racing family. His dad drives. His sister is going to drive as soon as she turns 16. Richard Hartman and Tom Hoover. Hartman bobbles a bit, regains control, and it is Richard Hartman defeating Tom Hoover. 549 at 263 to a 606 at 269. Let's go to Brock with Nick Senior. <laughs> 549, what do you think? I can't believe it. I can't believe it. It's the first time we're in the semifinals. We've been trying for 30 years. 30 years. 30 years. How about that? Well, congratulations. Okay, thank you very much. Go get them. I got to thank my crew. <laughs> All right. You notice he didn't say a final. He said a semifinal in 30 years. Richard Hartman will race Mark Oswald and Hartman. What a job he's doing in that car. Has Lane Choice. John Forrest, well, we told you earlier, he has Lane Choice over at McCullough. The funny car, semi. Ooh, don't be missing those. They should be absolutely sensational. But first, we got some pro stock action coming up. Mark Pollock facing Warren Johnson in the pro stock semifinal. Don't go away. Good afternoon here at the NHRA High Low Cajun Nationals. Bruce Larson in the left side of your screen experienced a severe blower explosion racing against Ed McCulloch. Now Steve is in the pits with a report on that incident. I am going to show you exactly why Bruce Larson had that blower explosion. Now these are called adjuster nuts. The one on the left here, that's how it's supposed to look screwed into the end of the rocker arm. This is the one that broke. That little ball came off. When it did, it allowed the push rod on number three cylinder to slide out of the exhaust valve. It's pushing up and down on the camshaft, but not doing anything. Okay, now, the intake valve, it's still trying to open, but the cylinder pressure is now so high without the relief from the exhaust valve that it can't penetrate that pressure, and the intake valve either bends or breaks. The spark plugs, they're still firing. Some of that fire comes up through the manifold into this area and kaboom goes the blower. Now, were it not for this burst plate, which is mandatory, letting some of that pressure out, the blower wouldn't have just been sitting on a cocky angle on top of the engine, as you saw. It would have been gone and have taken the body with it. This could have been a lot worse than it was. Well, it's these subtle little rule changes, like the burst plate, that has made this board as safe as it is, because that manifold is full of fuel, and if something like that happens, it can literally explode. All right, here are two of the Lansing Legions, the Oldsmobiles of Mark Pollock and Warren Johnson getting ready to go in the Pro Stock semifinal. And Warren Johnson, always a power in this kind of competition, has lane choice, Steve. Well, they don't have to worry about blower explosions. They've got two huge four-barrel carburetors, 500 cubic inch engines, 2,350 pounds is the minimum weight. Very strictly enforced body regulations to keep them looking like Oldsmobiles. Mark Pollock cut a great light. He wasn't late he didn't red light he was right in the middle of solid light and it's enough to beat warren johnson with a slower elapsed time powing 742 johnson 741 the difference right on the starting line johnson throws away a beautiful 741 by being a little lax at the starting line i don't think he expected powick to cut such a good light because he hadn't been all day long so he was a little relaxed well you can't be relaxed in pro stock drag racing because you can see just what can happen to you he watched powick all the way down the race course here we see the comparisons 0.451 for powick 0.484 for johnson and that's just a little much to try to overcome your driving is razor sharp. You left on Warren Johnson, that was the difference. Well, I needed it. You know, I was a little lax the first two rounds, and uh, I can do it. I know I can, and uh, it just gave me the morale booster I needed for the final, and boy, we're ready. I just hope I got a shot at lane choice. Don't get too hopped up now. 
Uh, I'll be fine. Uh, after Memphis, by four thousandths of a second, the red light first round, I'll be ready. Okay. Mark Pollock. Oh, he's having a great day. Woo! Mark Pollock has finally found the middle ground between a red light and a lousy reaction time. Well, let's see how Daryl Alderman does now. He is the only Dodge driver to reach the semifinals, facing up against three Oldsmobiles. And uh, right now, he is going against one of the real tough guys, Larry Morgan in that car, and uh, right in the foreground here, Steve. Alderman in the far lane. He owes Morgan one. Morgan beat him in the final round at the last race at Memphis Motors for its part. Boy, they're taking a little time here. Is it a psych job, or are they just getting ready? I think they're just getting ready. Nobody's playing any games here. Now they're ready. Oh, it's another nice race. Alderman with a whole shot over Morgan. Morgan muscles by. 7.33 to Alderman, 7.43. So he would have needed over a tenth of a second hole shot to pull that one off, and it just wasn't there. Watch on the starting line. Watch the far lane, the red and white car. Look at the jump he got. I kind of suspect that Daryl Alderman knew Morgan was going to run good because he really cut a good light. Got that advantage. Didn't stay there long. Larry Morgan's car had a lot of horsepower. Watch him pull the entire car out in front of Daryl Alderman. And his 733 is going to temper the excitement of young Mark Pollock just a bit because Morgan has lane choice by a train length of the Pro Stock final round. And back in the pit area, They've been waiting 30 years for this. The Bon and Font family and their young driver, Richard Hart, been getting ready for the funny car semis. Good time here at the High Low Cajun Nationals. Well, you just ask these folks. They've been whooping and hollering all afternoon during a great day of racing. And now, let's go to Steve Evans in John Force's pit. In the past, you've heard me telling you about the benefits of belonging to the National Hot Rod Association. And I thought, why not let a loyal member racer like John Forrest do that? In fact, he's reading his national dragster. How about it, John? I sure am. You know, Steve, I've been uh, racing these top fuel cars for 16 years. And, you know, I've been an NHRA member all that time. Uh, I got my pen, I got my decal, my patch, my rule book, my national dragster. You know how I have brain fade without national dragster. I wouldn't even know where I'm at today. Don't forget the free home video if they call this number right now. Hey, couldn't live without it. Diamond P Sports, Drag Racing 89. Hey, you want to see John Forbes on his head again? Better join up now. <laughs> Great job, John. Thanks. Hey, thank Hey, you want to do it again? No, that was okay. Oh, no, I got to change that. No, you just like to talk. I was fine. Oh, no, I like I got I to say more things. Let's, let's do it again. Be proud. You did it in one take. I can't even do that. Okay. One take? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, here's a couple of guys that are only going to get one take. Michael Brotherton and Gary Ormsby. One of these guys goes on to the top fuel final. The other one heads home to the next drag race. I'll tell you, Gary Ormsby would like to look at the next week's national director in the Winston Points column and see that he had moved up near the top. If he's going to defend his title successfully, that's got to start to happen. This is the Ormsby car. He's been cutting great lights all day long. Part of that's driver and part of it's car. Lee Beard has this car set up, Don Garlitz, where it leaves. Two very evenly matched cars here, Steve. It's Ormsby out first, but not by much. But it's Ormsby in a rock at the finish line. 523 to a 532, winning speed 275 miles per hour. Let's go to the starting line. Brock Yates is with his crew chief, Lee Beard. Well, a 523 as Lee Beard looks down the racetrack uh, a little bit better. What do you think? Well, actually, it was a pretty amazing run. It had a cylinder down right when it left the starting line here. If it had fired all eight cylinders, it should have ran a lot better than that. We gave it a pretty good tune-up <laughs> coming into this thing. We need to get in these final rounds to get back in the points lead, and that's what it's going to take. That's good, Lee. Well, uh, you got some work to do then when you get back to the bits, huh? Oh, it's always that way. <laughs> okay. Congratulations. Lee Beard. But, you know, Don, sometimes if they run on all eight, they make too much power. Might have smoked the tires. That's right. And this is a track where sometimes they've done that. But Ormsby did a tremendous job at the starting line. When the car went into this round of 524 to 526, he certainly didn't trust Brotherton. But Brotherton's performance was not up to par, and Ormsby easily outran him. Okay, who will face Gary Ormsby in the final round? Will it be Gene Snow, or will it be Eddie Hill? Well, we're going to find out in just a moment as we watch Gene Snow uh, cinching down those shoulder harnesses. There is Fuzzy Carter making a final check on Eddie Hill's uh, 500 cubic inch, 4,000 horsepower nitro-burning engine. You can bet that Eddie Hill 
is concerned about this race because you just can't trust Gene Snow. He has come up with some fantastic runs from time to time. He either runs a real good run or smokes a tire. So Eddie Hill will be on his toes. They leave fairly close together. And it is Gene Snow by a clean car length. Oh, my Lord, 510 in the heat of the day with hardly any speed, 258 miles per hour. Hill losing at 522 to 61. As we see, Eddie Hill does take a starting line advantage, but he was carrying a cylinder. And the engine was not running properly, and Gene Snow was running just like a Swiss watch. Look at that thing motor down course. Oh, Eddie Hill had the best seat in the house, and in fact, he was watching Snow so close, he almost ran over the center line. Top fuel pairings. Gene Snow and Gary Earnsby with Gene Snow enjoying the lane choice. Now, let's go to Steve in the winter. Well, somebody forgot to tell Gene Snow's motor how hot and humid it is because it just fired a 510. Is that right? That's our best of the whole weekend. Man, that's super. Oh, well, that's incredible, considering it Ormsby, and that's a strong car. Your opponent just ran a 523, the opponent in the final round. We had lane choice, and to me, that's a whole lot right there, by 10th or better, huh? Yeah, I think you're right. The lane you won in is the lane to stay in. Oh, you ain't kidding us. Where we uh, won last year, I think 516s and stuff like that. Man, I'd love to do it again. 510, and it's just clean and dry. This engine is ready to run again. Yeah, you don't mind. And enjoying a theoretically big advantage in low elapsed time against his opponent at Gary Ormsby, but that can change a whole lot. As we watch the crew of Mark Pollock doing some final clutch work on his Oldsmobile, he will face Larry Morgan in the final. Stay tuned to TNN because immediately after our coverage here of the NHRA High Low Auto Supply Cajun Nationals, it's NHRA Today, the weekly magazine show of the sport of championship drag racing. We've got the funny car semifinals coming right at you. Don't you know this Louisiana crowd loves that red and white car, Mark Oswald, Brock? Oh, boy. He has won here, but believe it or not, it was in top fuel, not in funny cars a number of years back. But uh, he is a regular fixture uh, down here. He used to live in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, native of there, but now makes his home in Homo, Louisiana. And he's up against 22-year-old Richard Hartman, recruited by the Bon and Font family to drive that funny car after R.C. Sherman retired, shall we say. Mark Oswald is a driver, certainly has an engine experience. They're off. Oswald loses traction and almost loses the car. And it's Hartman all the way. The crew goes crazy. They're in the finals. A solid 551 at 265.56 miles per hour. Beautiful run by that young Richard Hartman. When you say, Steve, nice and cool. And he shows some, some really good car control. Earlier in the year, we showed you maybe one of the reasons why he's the only funny car out there with genuine racket pinion steering. It really responds to his touch. Well, he was also helped a great deal by Yeah, So we'll give it a shot. Okay, Richard, great job. Thank you. Oh, what a thrill for that young man from California. Well, right now, we're going to find out who his opponent will be. And I'll tell you what, whoever wins, Richard Hartman's is going to have his hands full, Don Garlitz. Well, between John Force and Ed McCullough, you couldn't find two finer or faster funny cars on the circuit. So he will have his hands full. You just saw the body up. There's no problem. That's part of the regimen that Austin Cole and John Force go through. They do the burnout on one magneto, then hook up the second one. They think that helps prevent floor explosions. Or It's kind of a superstition, I think, more than anything else right now. But they're not going to change anything. John Force and Ed McCullough, with the problems Mark Oswald is having, they may be the two best one to guard on the planet right now. Here we go. Ed McCullough dead sideways, almost puts the tail into the fence. John Forrest goes to the final round at 550, 265 miles per hour. Let's go to Brock with Austin Coyle. Well, Austin, uh, a 550, uh, not a record breaker, but that uh, right lane seems to be giving everybody problems. Well, in the heat we got right here and the deteriorating air conditions and all that, the main name of the game here is to stay consistent enough to get down the track. And uh, we can probably step it up a little bit to give us a little leeway for the final. This track doesn't want to give anybody anything, though. It looks like it's got to be a pretty conservative setup, huh? Oh, it has to be. The, the guy that, that uh, gets down the track will be the winner in the final. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That Austin Coyle is one cool cat. I don't believe I've ever seen him excited about anything. What a great funny car final this is going to be. The youngster Richard Hartman and the funny, funny car never here before against the veteran John Force. Before he got his helmet off, John Force ran over to the Richard Hartman car. What were you saying to them? 
because we're old match racers, that's why, and it's just good to see them old boys get to race them in the final. Nobody can lose here. You got Lane Joyce, and that could be a monstrous factor. <laughs> Very important. How'd she run? 5-5-0. Five, five, oh, you got it by 100. Tell old Ace, we was doing the deal in that round. It was great, huh? <laughs> Tired. Hey, you want to do that again? You want to do that? <laughs> Nick Battle. <down. laughs> he only needs one take, whatever he does, right? <laughs> As we watch the Larry Morgan crew getting ready for the Pro Stock Final. Stick around, we'll be right back at the High Low Cajun Nationals. Well, there you have a look at the Gene Snow Racing Team working on their top fuel dragster, getting ready for the finals here at the High Low Cajun Nationals. They, of course, will face off against Gary Ormsby's automobile from Northern California, a car that at this point is decidedly slower than the Snow car. Earlier, Steve filed this report on one of the sportsman competitors. If you ever thought, boy, it'd be fun to campaign a dragster in one of the many NHRA sportsman classes, but it wouldn't fit in my garage at home, and the wife's not going to hear me renting some shop clear across town, I'm never home at night, here's a solution. The F Economy Dragster class. This little critter would fit in a good-sized lawn shed. The wheelbase is only 113 inches as opposed to the maximum of 300 inches. This is Bob Babineau's car from right here in Louisiana, and it's a pretty good ride. Eight seconds, 150 miles per hour, powered by the old Iron Duke Pontiac four-cylinder engine with the high performance head and brock how did bob babineau do in competition eliminator and while you're at it who are the other sportsman winners what well, it did just fine steve actually went all the way through a big field of the semifinals in competition eliminator before being defeated by this man david nickens who then went on to win the class with a victory over terry bishop an excellent win there by nickens other winners in the sportsman classes were top alcohol dragster, first victory ever for Amy Ball, Danny Townsend in the top alcohol funny car, super stock to S.E. Buchanan, the stock class to Ron Carey, super cop Kurt Dameron, super gas Harry Sullivan. Our congratulations to all those winners. And now it's time for the first of our pro category finals, pro stock. Mark Powick in that uh, kind of a purplish Oldsmobile, purple and silver, and of course the beautiful green and white machine of Larry Morgan. And Big Daddy, you gotta like the power of Morgan and the starting line tactics of Powick here. It just about evens them out. And the whole situation is gonna be, is Larry Morgan gonna be too conservative on the starting line, hoping that his power will overtake Powick? Or is Powick gonna leave too early in red light? It's anybody's guess. And the RPMs start to come up, they're ready. Powell up away first, but not by much. Morgan just about next. Wheels with him. It is Larry Morgan for the third NHRA race in a row. 739, 187.14 to Mark Powell's losing, but game 745. Beautiful start by Mark Powell. He takes a starting line advantage, and it looks like he's going to do all right. But the powerful engine of Larry Morgan begins to make up the ground as we start down through the middle of the course. And as they get to the halfway mark, Morgan has already begun to gather up that little lead that Powick had. And by the time they get to the finish line, it's all over. Three in a row for Larry Morgan. You know, when you give a guy a hammer, what's he supposed to do? Use it. <laughs> when you use it on Mark Powick. Let me tell you, buddy, I am happy. Thank God. You're always happy. I'm always happy. Thank God for Castro. Yeah, I have to really thank Castro, Bob Pinella, my engine builder, Jim Oliver, head porter, Andy Magnuson, my wife, my boy, Pinella, Gary Pearman, Tom Roberts, all the guys here that helped me. Oldsmobile. Something else has happened here. You have moved into the Winston Points lead. Have I really? That's, that's great. I'm really happy. Mark Powick is not quite as happy, but hey, glad to be in the final round. I'm, I'm sure happy to be in the final with him. Man, it's nice to bring you him. got a whole shot on him, but not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, Steve. One of these days, we're going to win one of these real soon. No question about that. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Thank you. Great race in pro stock. As we get ready for the funny car final, this is the John Forrest automobile being rolled up to the line. We'll be back with that right after this. Here at the NHRA High-Low Cajun Nationals, only two side-by-side -side affairs remain. The final in double-A fuel funny car, the final in top fuel dragster. When you see the onboard camera, you know it's John Force. John has selected the left or near lane. Opposite him, 
is a California kid, just 22. Doesn't live but about 20 miles from John's house, Richard Hartman. John has known the family that campaigns that car, the Bon and Fonz, well, for years and years, as he said earlier, they match race together. They've all come up the long, hard way, the Bruce Larsons of the world. Earlier, I talked to Nick Bon and Fonz. Nick, when you needed a driver, why would a Pennsylvania team pick a California driver very young and very inexperienced? Well, I thought the team needed a nice young driver. It was aggressive, and he wanted a win. And uh, Richard what came up to me at the Winter Nationals and said, Boy, he was sure looking to drive my car, and he gave me his phone number, and that's what set it off. It was great. Best thing that ever happened to me. He just walked up. Boy, you're going to have everybody giving you your phone number now. <laughs> yeah, but uh, only one Richard Hartman. Did you have to train him just a bit? No, actually, Richard had a good background. He, he raced with his dad in California, Virgil Hartman, and he did a really good job. And I, I look, I've been, I'd been really watching him. So when he, when he came up and approached me, it was a dream come true. You knew who he was. Absolutely. What a choice. I think I did a great uh, choice with Richard. Good luck. Thank you. What a great uh, combination. One of the real veterans in the business uh, with one of the kids. And they'll be going against two old pros, John Force and his crew chief, Austin Coyle. A tough combination to beat, Big Daddy. This should be one of the better funny car races of the day. These two cars come into this round. John Force with a 550, Richard Hartman with a 551. And Richard Hartman has not been psyched out by any of these experienced drivers. So it should be very good car race. Absolutely. Richard Hartman does the clutch in his car, so he knows exactly what to expect. He's a valuable crew member as well. John Ford, we all left first, everybody. We're right with Ford, and we won it. John Ford via the whole shot. 545 to a quicker 544. Young Hartman will be sick about that. Let's go to Brock. Well, I'll tell you what, Aston, they just don't come any closer than that. Uh, it was a hell of a drag race. Boy, I'll say, the way the conditions were, we had to step our stuff up a little, still being scared of smoking the tires, and we got it to pick up to just what we were shooting for. Our, our opponent apparently picked up even a little more. I believe that's his best run of the race. So our driver pulled this one out for us, winning with a slower ET. I'm sure that'll make him happier than it makes me, but the money still spends the same. You got it. Congratulations. Thank you. Great work. Austin Coyle. The constant banner between Austin Coyle and John Force. It's so wonderful to listen to, John Garland. Well, old John Force was certainly thinking about those Winston points when that light went green because he pulled a hole shot on young Richard Hartman. And he needed it because he ran a slower ET than that kid. But it was very, very close. The kind of race that the fans really like to see. In the comparison, we see it. 0.488 for Force and a 0.517 for Hartman. And that's what won the race. No sooner than these race cars stopped, both drivers started screaming, Who won? Who won? John Force, you won. That was close. Hey, since the snake, I ain't had a kid make me that nervous before. Terrible, I must be getting old, I guess. <laughs> this is the greatest year you've ever had, and we've only run seven out of 19 races. Well, we moved up in second, and uh, yeah, it's going to be a long old season, but uh, you know, what can I say again? Jolly Rancher, Castrol, Easy Wider, Wax Shop, all the people behind me all supported this car, especially my family, my wife, and Austin Coyle. And you won in a whole shot, even sweeter. A whole shot, I can't believe it, I thought I was late. I can't hardly talk, it's those brazos again. <clears throat> I thought I was late. You weren't late. What was the times? 45 to a 44. 45 to a 40. He ran quicker? Yeah. <laughs> Coyle, where's he at? He'll be down here soon. Let's go to top fuel. Brock, done. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Steve. If uh, Ormsby and Snow run any closer than those two, it's going to be practically a dead heat. That was about as close a funny car race as you'll ever see. Well, that's the kind of race that they came to see, and that's what they pay. There's a problem on Gene Snow's car. The engine went lean. The crew member had to shoot a little fuel in the injector to make the engine pick up the fuel again. He could have lost fire, and it could have been all over right there. It would have been all over had not that old crew person hey, had something to squirt that injector. The continuing saga of John Ford. Good job, bud. Can you believe it? 488 light. Didn't need stage. Didn't need stage. I don't remember nothing. All right, we've got a final race to run. One of these drivers will soon join the winter celebration at the far end of the racetrack. Will it be Gary Ormsby or will it be Gene Snow? It almost wasn't Gene Snow. Well, I'll tell you, when I drove these top fuel dragsters, a thing like that used to rattle me when the engine almost died and the crew had to run up there and 
shoot fuel in the injectors. I hope it doesn't affect Gene Snow's performance this afternoon. All right, Snowman in the far lane. The defending champion, the man that wears the big number one on his wing, Gary Ormsby in the near lane. He has not won yet this season. Ormsby with one of the best reaction times of the day in any class. It is Ormsby. A sigh of relief from his crew chief, a 5.15 to a 5.14, much like the funny car final round. Let's go to Brock with Lee Beard. Well, Lee, I'll tell you what, we got to give uh, Mr. Ernsby some points on that one. That was a great piece of driving. Oh, he did a spectacular job for us all day here. We're really proud to be part of this Castrol team. We won in all three of the pro categories. It wasn't our team, the tune-up, that did it. My guys worked awfully hard today, but Gary did a superb job of driving. That's why we're here in the winter, sir. Under difficult conditions, this racetrack was uh, far from ideal. We've had some problems making a lot of horsepower in the hot air, and uh, we need to do a little testing, get caught up in that area, but uh, we're coming on it. Well, it was a great show and a great race. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, Lee Beard. We won here. Excellent show at Baton Rouge. Well, Lee Beard rightfully gives credit to Gary Ornsby for a fine driving job all day long. And here we see him take a tremendous starting line advantage. But the power of the Gene Snow engine quickly overcomes that advantage, and it looks like he might go on to win. But Gene Snow starts into a slight wheel stand, has to momentarily backpedal, and that's all Gary Ornsby needed to pull the win out for the team. Now, as we look at the comparisons on the screen, we see how Ornsby won with the .434 starting line advantage over Gene Snow's .504. And I'll tell you, that's where the drags are won. The reigning Winston champ has struck his first blow of the 90s. Congratulations, Gary. Yeah, I didn't think it was going to ever happen, Steve. It was a great job for the crew, you know, to... I don't know what we ran. 515. 515. I knew it was going to step up a little bit. And anyone that wins on this racetrack and under these conditions, they did a super job for me this weekend. Gene Snow's car, I don't know if you could see, but it lost fire. A crewman alertly got it back to life. He almost had a single. I saw the flames coming out of it uh, back there, but I really didn't know what was happening. You know, I was just kind of watching my own car, but I didn't see. Why to drive. Thank you. Great we can hear the horn honking already for Gary Ornsby's crew. What a great day of racing here at Baton Rouge. Some of the closest competition we've ever seen in the pro categories. Our congratulations to Gary Ornsby, John Force, and Larry Morgan for a great, great effort. For Steve Evans and Big Daddy Don Garlitz, I'm Brock Yates. Thanks for joining us. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Palish. Produced and directed by John B. Mullen. It's most popular car.